Good afternoon and welcome to Hand Wavy Chemistry, where we do not delight in the details, but rather bask in the big picture. Today, it's problem time, where we answer chemistry-related questions. The question for today is how do you write an electron configuration? We're going to start out with some simple examples and slowly get more and more complicated, ending with the type of questions that most commonly trip people up. There are three styles of question we're going to be looking at today. The first is the very straightforward and direct. What is the electron configuration of? The next is a little bit more complex and will involve some extra thinking. It's more along the style of, a chlorine atom gains an electron. What is its new electron configuration? And the final type of question is going to be, complete the following table with all the entries related to electron configuration. So let's jump into answering that first kind of question. What is the electron configuration of a particular atom? To do this successfully, we need to make friends with a periodic table. If we look at the full periodic table, we see that there are 118 different elements. It is not reasonable to expect someone to remember 118 different electron configurations. And considering that we can also have ions, there are even more possible electron configurations than these 118. So I'm going to show you a modified version of the periodic table. The color coding on this version of the periodic table relates to the types of suborbitals. There are S suborbitals, P suborbitals, D suborbitals, and F suborbitals. If you'd like to know more about where these types of suborbitals come from, there is a video linked above and down in the description. So let's start with a very simple example of hydrogen. Hydrogen is the very first element. It's in the first row of the periodic table, so we're going to start by writing a 1. We've color coded it red because those are S orbitals, so it's an S and it has just one electron, so it is a 1s1. If we go to the next element, we have helium. We're still in the first row, so it's a 1. They're still red, so it's an s. But now, there are two electrons. We could count 1, 2, so it's 1s2. Let's jump ahead a few elements to boron. This is where boron is on the periodic table. So we're going to start by writing in all the different types of subshells and putting in the right number of electrons until we reach boron. So we still have to do that first row where we have a 1s. And as we saw of helium, there's just the 2. So it's a 1s2. On the next row, we've got 1, 2, which are red, which are s. We're on the second row, so we write 2s2. And finally, We've got one of these yellow ones, so there is one P, but we're on the second row, so we write 2P1. Now I've moved the periodic table over this time because I want to do the electron configuration of phosphorus. And I've marked it on the periodic table with a P, which is the symbol for its element. And you can see that it's down on the third row. So it's going to start taking up quite a bit of space. But let's work through it. We've got the first row of the periodic table. So we write 1. S2. The second row, we're going to go 2s2, and there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 p possible electrons, so it's 2p6. On the third row, we still have 2s options, so we go 3s2, and then finally, we're going to go 1, 2, 3, 3p3. Three, three. You can see from this that we very quickly start taking up a lot of space if we write out the entire electron configuration. So we actually have a shorthand way to do this. What we do is rather than writing out the rows above where we are, we instead write the noble gas, so the element at the end of the row before the one we're starting at. So in this case, this is the final element on the row before we started at, and that's neon, so we do in a square brackets, N, E. 
This means start with the electron configuration of neon. And from here, we'd write our 3s2, 3p3. This gives us a much quicker way to write out electron configurations and a much less lengthy way to write out our electron configurations. Atoms are able to gain and lose electrons, becoming ions. And when they do so, their electron configuration changes. So let's look at the question that I asked before. A chlorine atom gains an electron. What is its new electron configuration? Well, chlorine sits here on the periodic table. When an atom gains electrons, we're gonna to have to move along to the right. When it loses electrons, we'd move along to the left. So it's gaining one electron. So we're gonna move over one space to the right. It's going to have the same electron configuration as argon. So let's write it out. We'll use our shorthand from before. We'll say, let's start with the electron configuration of neon. Then it's 3s2, because there's one, two s electrons on the third row of the periodic table. And then it's gonna be 3p, and we're gonna count. One, two, three, four, five, six. So 3p, six. You may also be able to get away with just writing the same electron configuration as argon. Up until this point, I've been focusing on elements in the top three rows of the periodic table. And there's a good reason for that, which is that as we get further down, some funny business can start to happen. Well, of course, one thing to keep in mind is that the 3D suborbital is actually on line four of the periodic table. So we have here the 4S suborbital, but this section here is the 3D suborbital. And then here we get back into 3P. So while the S and the P, the suborbitals appear on the same line as we would expect, the value for the D suborbital is one less than the line that it is on. So, for example, if we were asked to find the electron configuration of gallium, which is right here on our periodic table, we would start by saying, well, let's take the electron configuration of argon, which is the noble gas from the row above. Okay, we've got this section here. Those are our 4s, so we've got 4s2. All of this section here, those are 3d, and there are 10 of them, and then we've got just one of these, 4p1. You may also see it written as start with argon, then do 3d10, 4s2, 4p1. Both of these are equivalent. However, when we start ionizing elements that have partially filled d electrons, things don't necessarily go the way you might expect. For example, if we were asked, what is the electric configuration of titanium two plus? Titanium is located here on the periodic table. So you might expect the answer to be, start with the electron configuration of argon and then 4s2 and leave it at that. But actually we lose 4s electrons before we lose the 3D electrons. So the correct answer for this question is to start with the electron configuration of argon, and then it's just 3D2. There's nothing in the 4S. If you'd write it out, you would write 4S0. We lose those electrons before we lose the 3D electrons. Titanium can also be titanium four plus, in which case we just would have the electron configuration of argon. And if we were to think about the 3D and the 4S suborbitals, there would be 3D zero and 4S zero. It's lost all of those electrons. The final complicating factor when it comes to writing out electron configurations is that there is additional stability associated with having full or half full suborbitals. And this can give rise to a number of exceptions. 
For example, if we were to talk about silver, so what is the electron configuration of silver? Silver is located here on the periodic table. It is easy to assume that the answer is to start with the krypton electron configuration and then look at our d orbitals. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So I'll go, okay, I'm going to have my 4d9 and we're on the fifth row and so there's s of so 5s2. But this is actually incorrect. It is more stable to have a full d orbital and a half filled s orbital. So the actual electron configuration of silver is the electron configuration of krypton, but then it's to have 4d10, 5s1. And when silver ionizes, it loses one electron to become silver plus, and the electron configuration changes to, let's start with a core of krypton, and then just 4d10. And if we were to think about the s orbitals, it would be 5s0. Which leads me into my final question. Complete the following table. This is a real first year chemistry exam question. And what they're looking for is, does the student understand about the stability associated with having a half filled and filled suborbital? Or will they simply continue the trend and go D3D1, 3D2, 3D4, 3D5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So the two exceptions that the student needs to be aware of are for chromium and for copper. So in the case of this chromium, we're going to only put a single electron into the 4s suborbital because that way we can have a 3d5 giving us a partially filled orbital. And in the case of copper, it's just like we saw with silver. We're going to have a 4s1, so that way we can have 3d10. The rest of these elements would follow the expected trend. For example, iron, it would be 4s2, 3d6. Nickel, 4s2, 3d8. So my final advice to you, when you are confronted with a question which relates to what is the electron configuration of something, is to make sure that you understand how the periodic table is structured and that you are good friends with it. It's going to make your life so much easier when answering. Start by finding the appropriate element on the periodic table. If it's gained or lost electrons, move to the right or left as appropriate. Move to the right if it's gained electrons, move to the left if it's lost electrons. And then pay attention to if it is very close to having one of those full or half full d orbitals. Because if it does, then you should look into whether it makes sense to just put a single electron into the s orbital so that you can have a half full or full d suborbital. And keep in mind, again, one more complication. When transition metals, transition metals being elements that have a partially filled d orbital, lose electrons. They lose it from the s suborbital before they lose electrons from their d orbitals. I hope you have enjoyed this video. And if you have, please make sure to like and subscribe and share it with your friends. Also, if you have any questions you'd like to see answered in a future problem time, please put them in the comments below. Thank you, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day.